a very warm welcome to everybody uh, to our week three of the Sesame Fair Book Seminar Series. Uh, we've got a great speaker lined up for today. Um, and what I'll do now is hand over to Michaela, and then you'll hear from Mike, who's going to um, introduce our speaker today. So, Michaela, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining the Psychology Seminar Series. So I'm just going to talk about the housekeeping rules. Uh, just a reminder that this seminar is being recorded and will be available on the Psychology YouTube playlist. So upon entry of the webinar, you have all been muted and we ask that you please stay muted for the duration of the seminar. We will have question time at the end of the seminar. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A box below at any time. Alternatively, if you raise your hand, I will unmute you to ask your question. Thank you, and I'll hand off to Mike Smithson um, to welcome our uh, guest speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm introducing Professor Ben Bradley, who uh, I've known for many, many years. We spent uh, a number of years at James Cook University working together. And we left at about the same time, um, whereas I went to a lowly senior lecturer position at that time, Ben went to take the foundation chair in psychology at Charles Sturt University, uh, which, he, which he held from 1998 to 2006. And he then uh, went on to become director of uh, the uh, Charles Sturt University Degree Initiative Program, and, and he was elected presiding officer of the Academic Senate there. Uh, ben uh, retired in 2017, if memory serves, and, uh, and was uh, promptly awarded emeritus status there. Uh, ben, despite all this administrative work, work that he did, Ben had uh, plenty of time and room and brain space to do research. And he's one of those psychologists who looks beyond the discipline and brings things in from it, uh, from elsewhere. Um, so his, his uh, earlier books, uh, Visions of Infancy, which was published, I think, in 1989, and, um, uh, and Psychology of Experience are among the examples of the kind of, uh, the kind of scholarship that, uh, that he is capable of doing. And it turns out that after uh, more than a century since Darwin's uh, passing, in, I think it was 1882, um, Ben's treatment is the first scholarly in-depth treatment of Darwin's ideas about psychology. That's remarkable in the way that it's taken this long for someone to do this. But Ben is exactly the kind of person to do it because his work is, is not siloed within psychology. And so I think we're in for a really fascinating talk. And so with that, I give you Ben Bradley. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I'm very glad to be here virtually. I was hoping to make it in person, but uh, this is one of the few benefits of COVID that we know how to do Zoom now. So yes, I would like to introduce me, you to uh, Darwin's psychology uh, through his theory of agency. Um, I just thought I'd say a couple of words about how I tripped over his psychology. I'd been aware of his writings on uh, philosophy and psychology that he began as a young man in his 20s. But in 2009, I was, which is his 200th birthday, I was asked to make a film for a Darwin Festival in Cambridge in the UK. And in doing that, I discovered that he could explain a set of findings that I had made with uh, my partner, Jane Selby, and also with Mike, Smithson, that human babies are capable of group interaction, that is supradyadic interaction, from before the time they form attachments. And uh, Darwin's psychology was the only psychology I could discover which explained that finding. So then I went off and had a closer look and eventually got a contract to write a book which came out just late last year. It hasn't yet arrived in Australia, but it will on 23rd of April, apparently. That is one of the downsides of COVID because there is coming by ship. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll now start screen sharing um, and I'll just talk through that. And so here we go. Um, at least. Let's see, there we go. 
Um, I'm actually going to just hope you're here. Let's see where I can get this to work. So that's a picture of our babies interacting in groups. That's the finding that started me off on this track. Um, so the overview of the talk is that I want to start just by making sure we're all on the same page, as it were, about evolutionary science. Uh, so do a bit of an introduction about what's going on today in evolutionary science. Then I'll talk about Darwin's theory of agency, um, its place in his account of evolution, its place in his explanation of psychological matters, and then uh, return to the title, you know, and ask for questions. So that's, that's how I intend to go on. So evolutionary science today. What I've done is that to start off with is just take a direct quotation from a very successful book, Biological Psychology by James Callat, uh, the latest edition, I think it's the 13th edition, um, where he summarizes our contemporary understanding of uh, how evolution works. Uh, it has three points. Um, the first, I'm just going to shrink that. Um, the first is because of genetic influences, offspring generally resemble their parents. That is, like begets like. Uh, fairly straightforward. Second, mutations, recombinations, and microduplications of genes introduce new heritable variations that help or harm an individual's chance of surviving and reprodu reproducing. And thirdly, certain individuals reproduce more than others do, thus passing on their genes to the next generation. Any gene that is associated with greater reproductive success will become more prevalent in later generations. Therefore, the current generation of any species resembles the individuals who reproduced in the past. If a change in the environment causes a different gene to increase, that gene will spread in the population. So, uh, if I was in the room, I would ask if everyone was happy with that as a summary of how we currently think about evolution. Um, I'm going to return to this slide at the end because I suggest each of these three statements needs a lot of caveats around it, uh, both in the light of modern biology, 21st century biology, and in the light of what Darwin actually said. And now I want to introduce you to the three phases of evolutionary science, which I'm, I'm uh, proposing. First of all, we've got Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin died in 1882, as Mike said. Um, his, his first publication on evolution or his first book, he did have a brief paper in 1858, but 1859 was the publication of On the Origin of Species, which he revised substantially and through six editions up to 1876. But also during that period, um, those 23 years, he tried to produce, to complete his project, which was to apply what he proposed in On the Origin of Species to human beings, because he knew that was the absolute make or break for him getting his theory accepted. If he, if he couldn't explain human beings, and particularly human psychology, um, then he, everyone would be able to preserve some divine, you know, an explanation in terms of uh, divine creation of the human, human mind and soul. So he's very keen to, to uh, ensure that was um, knocked on the head, as it were. Then from 1882 to 1942, there was a so-called eclipse of Darwinism. Uh, that's a phrase, the eclipse of Darwinism is a phrase that has been taken up by historians, though it's first framed by Julian Huxley. And Julian Huxley, um, who is a grandson of Darwin's friend, Thomas Huxley, in 1942, published a book which brought together a lot of strands of then contemporary biology, including genetics, Mendelian genetics, population genetics, and uh, taxonomic work, particularly by people like Ernst Mayer and Theodosius Dobzhansky, and brought it together in a, in a book called Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. And ever since then, the modern synthesis has been uh, used to refer to what's sometimes called the gene's eye view of evolution. And it's very much this view that uh, colors sociobiology, and evolutionary psychology. Um, 
and also i would say collapse three points we've recently met um, but i'll come back to that later then um, in the 1980s and up to today there's been a proposal very contested by by people who are still in invested in the modern synthesis uh, that we need to extend that synthesis. So we get something called the extended evolutionary synthesis. And a key early publication here was by Richard Lewontin, the Harvard biologist, who wrote a paper called Gene, Organism and Environment. And the crucial word there is organism, because in the modern synthesis, you basically have two random processes, two roulette wheels, if you like, You've got the random mutation and recombination of genes on the one side, producing characters which are then selected by an environmental roulette of um, events that either favor or um, disfavor uh, particular genetic genes in the, in, and so evolution progresses through a kind of uh, a lottery run on both the genetic level and the environmental level. But Lewontin in introduced the notion of organism, that organism itself has a role to play in evolution. And he gives us an example in that paper, uh, the idea that you have a fly, he, he studied Drosophila, fruit flies, you have a fly that is, is hatches out of its pupa, particularly small, small for whatever reason it might be genetic it might be developmental it might be for any reason but once that organism has hatched out relatively small it's different surface to to volume ratio it, it means it heats up and cools down more than larger its larger cousins means that it will have a different fate from a fly that was born larger and that has nothing to do with the origin of its smallness. It is simply about the organism's own phenotypic, phenotypic being the characters we have um, that uh, the creature has as an organism rather than genetic characters, which is the genotype. The phenotypic characters have their own consequences for evolution. And that was, a, that was an important paper and it's been taken up in various ways by many different branches of uh, evolutionary biology. One is called EVO-DEVO or evolutionary developmental biology, which generally stresses epigenetics, which is the vagaries of gene expression. You know, some, we can have DNA, but sometimes we have genes which may or may not be expressed. And that depends on how the cell is functioning and how the chromosomes are controlled, often by other genes, but sometimes by hormones and so on. Developmental systems theory, which stresses that um, uh, the, the dualism of uh, gene and environment is actually a false dualism because they all form part of a system. Um, and niche construction, which stresses the agency of animals like beavers and birds to which create uh, and change the environments they're in, particularly human beings, of course, massively. But uh, all organisms do have effects on environment, which then have knock-on effects on how, they, how that organism evolves. And finally, developmental plasticity in the theory of the phenotype. Mary Jane West Eberhard wrote a book called Developmental, developmental Plasticity and Evolution, where she stresses that phenotypes are plastic and can change. Plastic includes behavior. They, they, you know, we, we can adapt as organisms to the environment we're in. And that uh, is crucial, she argues, for evolution. They all stress development, you notice, except niche construction. The, the development is a crucial thing. And, and this is a diagram which actually comes from a book on uh, the extended evolutionary synthesis. And it's called The Continuous Expansion of Evolutionary Theory, the diagram is called. And um, the, the three the three ovals the smallest one is is darwin's contribution um the middle one is the modern synthesis and the large red one is the extended evolutionary synthesis so this is very much read from the present back to the past because darwin is said to have come up with the ideas of variation inheritance and natural selection 
it implies this diagram that he had nothing to say about development, phenotypic plasticity, niche construction, multi-level selection. These are all seen as modern inventions post-1980. Um, and in the middle, you've got the things that we probably, and, and collapse certainly, associates with evolution, mutation, Mendelian inheritance, populate, population genetics, contingency, that is sort of random genetic and environmental events, and the, and the speciation. So that's, that's, uh, that's my brief synopsis for evolutionary, uh, where we are up to. So just, just to finish off um, uh, this section of the talk, uh, here is Julian Huxley uh, reading Darwin through the lens of his own work. He says, one of the great merits of Darwin was to show that the purpose of purposiveness of organic structure and function was apparent only Adaptation is capable of being accounted for on good mechanistic principles without the intervention of purpose, conscious or subconscious, on the part of the organism. And then you've got Lewontin when he's actually critiquing Huxley, also claiming that Darwin portrayed organisms as passive objects molded by the external force of natural selection. So that is the 20th century view of Darwin, read through the lens of the gene's eye view. Now let's have a look at what Darwin actually said, um, which is an unusual thing to do because um, his books are so fat. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is agency nowadays. Um, the crucial thing that I want to just note is that all living organisms are what are called open systems. That is, they don't obey the second law of the thermodynamics. That is that we all tend towards a maximum of disorder. They take in energy in the form of food or sunlight or whatever it happens to be, and they use that energy as open systems to maintain structure and to do work. So this little picture, the, the person eating the sausage roll or whatever it is, hot dog, is eating complex macromolecules, so that's some energy coming in. And they're also walking, which is the kinetic energy, which is the work they're doing. So if we, so open systems are intrinsically agentive. Because we're open systems, we're always doing things. We can't help doing things. Um, and that means we maintain a structure and we do work. So a clock, a clock, if you wind it up, it eventually winds down. And if you leave it for long enough, it rusts. But an open system maintains itself at a level in a level of order and it does work. And initial, the initial model for a, an open system was a steam engine, um, but uh, we are slightly more complicated than steam engines. So obviously Darwin knew nothing about systems theory. So let's, let's go back to the beginning and imagine him as a teenager going to university at Edinburgh to study medicine which is what he did at the age of 16, to be with his older brother Erasmus, who was all, already there studying medicine. And he, he went to Edinburgh, which is also where I did my PhD, and to the north of Edinburgh is the Firth of Forth. And Darwin was really happiest wandering along the edge of the Firth of Forth, picking up uh, organisms out of the, uh, uh, along, the, along the shore. And one of the organisms he picked up is a, is a zoophyte, that is an animal that looks like a plant, called Flustra. And this is a picture of Flustra by Robert Hooke, dating from the 17th century. And it's a little plant that looks a bit like a tree. Uh, well, it's actually an animal, I should say. It's a zoophyte. It looks like a tree. It's about a hand, the size of your hand, and that's what it looks like. Now, Darwin captured some of these things, took them home, and looked down his microscope at them, and he saw that they had eggs. And he looked at the eggs down his microscope, and he noticed they moved. And this was the first time anybody had noticed that the eggs of zoophytes actually have independent motility. And this was a crucial question back in the 18. 20s, which is when he was at, in Edinburgh, before he moved to Cambridge because he was a bit squeamish and he didn't like, he was doing medicine, he didn't like the, the anatomical part of the dissection part of medicine. He, he discovered the motility of the ova of flustra, 
And this was uh, important because at that time, people were wondering whether life was intrinsic to organisms, whether the motility of small, like of, um, small things like the eggs of Flustra was intrinsic to the organism or whether it was a consequence of external energy like heat uh, or collision with other objects um, uh, or possibly, you know, divine inspiration. And, and Darwin could actually see that they had little cilia, which are like little hairs that rode them around. And um, he told his professor, Robert Grant, who then treated the discovery as his own, as Robert Grant's own, which annoyed Darwin very much, but it was Darwin's first discovery, which is, uh, was important because it should, was uh, answered, that it was, uh, gave him an angle on what life is. Then he, he spent his whole life studying plants and it, it, one of his, his, his later, his, one of his last books was called uh, The Power of Movement in Plants. It came out in 1880, two hours, two days before, uh, two years before he died. Um, and he discovered, a, he, or, or he, he did a lot of experiments, up to a thousand experiments on what he called circumnutation, which is a circular motion, very, very slow circular motion of the growing points of plants, particularly their roots, radicals, the first root that a, a seed puts out, and it tends to head directly down into the earth because it's a root, so it's geotropic, and also climbing plants, which he studied a lot. And here's an example of a climbing plant, which is, goes curving round and round. And when it can find something solid to grasp onto, it grasps onto it. And um, he, he, some of his experiments with the roots of cabbage seedlings, he would block them from going down into the earth, but they found their way around the obstacles he put in their path and eventually still found how to plunge down into the earth. And that's why he called their movement purposive. Um, now, the other, the other, the, his very last publication was a book on earthworms. And here he also did a lot of experiments and he did it particularly on the earthworm dragging leaves into their holes to insulate them against the winter cold. So you see the earthworm on the left is dragging a leaf into, into its hole to insulate itself. So Darwin set up a worm area on top of his piano and he, he made all sorts of um, artificial leaves out of greased paper, all sorts of different shapes. And what he showed was that worms always picked up, well, always, about three quarters of the time, picked up the, work, the, um, the leaf, the artificial leaf, by the most, what he reckoned, was the most efficient part of the leaf to jam its hole. So if it was a, uh, something like a, uh, a sort of pointy um, eucalypt leaf, it would pick it up by the end of the leaf, not by the stalk, as you see in this picture. But if, you, if it had something like a fir needle, it wouldn't pick it up by the pointy needle end, it would pick it up by the stalk, which was slightly wider. And even with the uh, leaves that the worms had never seen before, they still seem to, um, as he said it, uh, act intelligently to insulate their, their wormholes. Um, now, so, so that's the first thing, purposive movement. Now, the second thing that was crucial to the way that he saw the world as a naturalist before he ever came up with his evolutionary theory was that there was a crucial link between habit and structure. So when he was on his beagle voyage um, and he was in South America on the east coast of Latin America, he, he saw a bird flying around, which they used to, they, we now call them black skimmers, but they're actually, he called them a scissor beak. And the scissor beak, as you can see in the top part of this picture, has a very odd beak. The lower um, mandible is, the, I think, an inch and a half longer than the upper one which is unknown anywhere else in the avian world. And he, he didn't know why that was until he saw the birds and how they, how they feed is at dusk and at dawn, they skim very low over estuaries and they, their lower bill is just runs a little furrow through the water 
and they do it at, in at dusk and dawn when the small fry, uh, the, the little fish are rising to the surface just before the sun sets or just after it's, uh, as it's rising. And that flicks up the fish and then they snap down the upper jaw, upper mandible, upper part of their bill on the creature. And he said without knowing that, he wouldn't have known what the point of that funny bill was. And then when he came to talk about sexual selection, he came across this moth, which is called a bark looper. And it, it, on the left, you see it with its wings closed, on the right with the wings open, it has these marvelous eyes. He says, but I have no idea why it has these eyes and its wings, because I've never seen it display. I've never seen what it does with those eyes. Until I do, I have no idea about its biology. So he, he believed that habit and structure went together. Um, now, the second thing to say, well, the third thing to say about agency is, and he keeps repeating this on the origin of species, he says, every action has a reaction, which we know we tend to associate with Newton. But his point was that every action has a, a reaction, which therefore builds up interdependencies between creatures and their environments. He called it an infinitely complex web of relations, which results from action and reaction. And uh, you'll see this links to his notion of social animals and social plants. So for example, he, one of his examples was thistle down. He said, well, thistles, thistle down, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have that construction for thistle down uh, and, unless the, uh, the plant, the, unless there was wind. If there was no wind, you wouldn't have thistle down. And the value of thistle down, of course, is that it allows thistles to spread their seeds far and wide and not just fall right next to them. So it allows the plant to spread. Mistletoe was another example because there's a whole bunch of animals and plants that hang around mistletoe. So mistletoe is parasitic, tends to live on trees, often apple trees. This is a mistletoe moth, um, Australian. And this is a mistletoe bird. So the mistletoe moth tends to, uh, to carry pollen from one flower, mistletoe flower to another. The mistletoe bird tends to eat the the fruit of mistletoe and carry them and, and through uh, de defecating in other trees that spreads the mistletoe. And um, in fact, interestingly, uh, it's been shown that comparing trees with and without mistletoe, it shows that trees that have mistletoe on, despite the fact that it's a parasite, actually do better then they tend to breed more prof prolifically than, birds, than trees without mistletoe because the, the, the butterfly, the moths and birds that are attracted to the mistletoe also fertilize the flowers of the tree. So everybody benefits from that. Uh, thistles, he called these social plants and he said that they give each other mutual aid because they, um, they fertilize each other uh, they, if, if some predator or some uh, clumsy cow tramples on them, others will survive. So, uh, you know, there's sort of safety in numbers. Um, bees, social animals also, um, he believed that they uh, have interdependencies within the species. They help each other, they signal to each other, uh, and they help rear the eggs, the pupae of bees, and also, of course, when we get to mammals, obviously there are, are lots of uh, interdependencies within the species of social animals. So that was a that's a sort of uh, brief journey through his some of the his principles of agency. So the next thing I want to talk a bit about is how agency figures in his theory of evolution. If you remember, in the modern synthesis, it has nowhere. It doesn't play any role, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about how Darwin saw evolution rather than Julian Huxley and his friends and Richard Dawkins and people like that. So, um, first of all, Darwin called natural selection a law, not a causal mechanism, or in his day they called, the, the words were vera causa, a true cause. Um, nowadays, we tend to think natural selection is a power or, or causal mechanism which makes things happen. 
But Darwin said it was a law. And he described a law as a statement subsuming a sequence of events as ascertained by us. One of his uh, examples of a law was gravity. He said natural selection had the same explanatory role as Newton's law of gravity. Now, gravity subsumes various types of event, tides, planetary orbits around the sun, falling weights, and so on. But even now, physicists do not agree about what processes cause gravity. Right? There's a 14 different theories of gravity currently competing. Now, likewise, the law of natural selection subsumes adaptations, the fossil record, the divergence of species, taxonomic relationships as seen in embryology, and so on. Um, now, Darwin did propose several processes or causal mechanisms which produce the effects he subsumes under the law of natural selection, inheritance, variation, differential reproductive success, mutual aid, transitional habits, I'll say a bit more about them in a minute, and a lot more. But he didn't think he'd come up with an exhaustive list, and um, he also proposes other things which, uh, uh, like sexual selection, for example, is, is another process, um, another law, which also contribute to evolution. So natural selection wasn't even the only law applying to evolution. And then the 20th century has added more processes, genetic mutation, recombination, genetic drift, vagaries of gene expression, that is epigenetics, and so on. So I just want to establish that difference between law and mechanism or law and cause. Now, the next thing is to, because agency was so important to Darwin, he, he generally talked about um, what he called his principle of divergence or what we call adaptive radiation was led by behavior or by agency. So if you imagine the Galapagos Islands where he found various different species of finch, all eating different kinds of things on the different islands which make up the Galapagos archipelago. You imagine, he imagined a common ancestor arriving from Latin America, perhaps blown in a, in a flock by some big wind or whatever. And they land and they, they scatter across the islands. And some of them start eating insects, some of them start eating seeds, some of them start eating cactus and some Meat, buds and fruit and so on and and because they develop different diets then that is backed up by what we would now know are genetic mutations and developmental processes so uh, once the habit is formed then the structure follows and one of his examples is this uh, the great build finch in uh, on the Galapagos Islands another one which I don't think he did notice is the vampire finch, which actually eats the blood of, amongst other things, it also eats parasites on the, some of the seabirds, but it actually has a very sharp bill which will pierce the, the skin of the booby or the gannet on which the, the finch is. And because they have different behaviors, the, the, the anatomy follows, if you like. Um, and he called these transitional habits. We now call it the Baldwin effect after James Mark Baldwin, who in the late 1800s, along with a couple of other authors, they all came up with the same idea at the same time. He called it, Baldwin actually called it organic selection. And Baldwin is also a great influence on Piaget. I mean, he's a very interesting character, Baldwin. Um, uh, came up with the notion of circular reactions and, uh, and various other terms, adaptation, assimilation, accommodation, all those terms were developed by Baldwin. But he was a, a very close reader of Darwin. And, and when people said, ah, oh, you, you know, well done, you came up with this notion of um, uh, a structure following habit, he said, no, actually it's in Darwin. And here is Darwin's example. So here we have a gray squirrel bouncing along. And here we have a flying squirrel. And Darwin argues that the flying squirrel is simply uh, the consequence of a behavioral change made by something like, you know, obviously an ancestor of the, the, both the gray squirrel and the flying squirrel, um, which presumably this ancestor, he says, I mean, he has a kind of thought experiment. He says, well, how would flying squirrels have developed? to illustrate what transitional habits are. And he says, well, they would have been, instead of leaping just from branch to branch, the, some ambitious squirrels obviously began to leap from treetop to treetop. And then as soon as that happened, any, any kind of uh, anatomical change uh, 
that uh, increase the flange of skin between the, the front and the back legs or increase the eyesight or increase, increase the spring of the back legs would have helped the flying squirrel to become better fitted to its new habits and therefore we, we end up with the animal we see before us. Um, so that's one set of examples but the next, uh, the next thing that Darwin insisted upon is that uh, what um, his half-cousin Francis Galton took up with alacrity and developed differential psychology, what we now call differential psychology, the notion of individual, difference, individual differences or variations. What these, how these originate in Darwin's theory depends on a distinction he drew when talking about inheritance. Now, he said when people talk about inheritance, they often forget that it has two distinct elements. These are his words, the transmission and the development of characters. So this is what tends to go missing in the, the modern synthesis and why the extended evolutionary synthesis is so insistent on development, whether it's epigenetics or phenotypic plasticity. What is missing from the account that genes do everything is the fact that genes have to develop before like begets like. And Darwin was in, insisted on this and he gave all sorts of examples. In particular, he talked about hybrids. And I found this nice picture on the internet. Um, so here we have a, some kind of alien father and a, a fairly human looking mother producing a son with a mixture of both characteristics. But interestingly, the son is uh, who has the characteristics of a human boy to some regard, has acquired those characteristics from a woman. And Darwin was aware of these kinds of examples, particularly in domestic animals, where you've sometimes got hybrids forming, that the offspring of hybrids show that we, what we now called, we have recessive genes. But he didn't need to have genetic theory to know that some genes, or some, what he called gemules, he didn't know about genes, but he had a different phrase for what he thought the units of transmission were. Some gemules don't develop, or they develop late, as in secondary sexual characteristics. Um, and so uh, you, you can't simply talk about transmission when you're talking about inheritance. You have to talk about what develops and what doesn't develop, and that's a different process. He also uh, was aware of what he called the impressibility or uh, what we now call the plasticity of development. And here are two 100-year-old identical twins that don't look identical. And that's, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of common sense, but it tends to get forgotten when we just talk about inheritance in terms of genetic transmission, that there's a whole developmental process there which can go differently depending what environments we are challenged by. And um, you, can, you can show this just as easily with, um, if you put uh, two sets of identical seeds, all genetically identical, in different soils, you get very different phenotypes. And the difference in the phenotype demonstrates the plasticity of the phenotype, and again, underlines the importance of development to the production of adaptations. Finally, uh, in this section, the struggle for existence is, Darwin says, metaphorical. And it's not just a matter of nature red in tooth and claw. Um, you get symbioses as between the bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the nodules on the roots of legumes, like peas and beans. And also the inter interspecific um, collaboration between moths and orchids, which he wrote a whole book on, the first book he wrote after The Origin of Species. And this moth, actually, he predicted the existence of the moth. Somebody sent him a, an orchid from Madagascar with, a, with a, a flower with a pistol, which was 11 inches in length. And he said, well, there must be a moth with a tongue that's 11 inches long, a proboscis that's 11 inches long. And everybody laughed at him. But about 1903, somebody discovered the moth. Um, so um, just to show that there is sort of a, it's not all, there's some cooperation goes on in the process of evolution. And also finally, 
um, just to remember that Darwin actually changed his views uh, between the first and the last volume of On the Origin of Species. Um, he, he came to the conclusion that instead of talking in terms of individuals and what we now call genes, so he said natural selection will adapt the structure of each individual for the benefit of the community if each in consequence profits by the selective change. So when he's thinking about social animals, that sounds like the kind of view that there's no such thing as group selection. But for, in the last two editions of On the Origin of Species, he, um, he changed that to say that social animals will adapt the structure of each individual for the benefit of the whole community if the community profits by the selected change. Okay. And, and finally, uh, that just to online that point, he said that social animals evolve differently from non-social animals and plants because they, the primary thing for them is the cohesion of the group in which they live rather than just uh, adapting directly to the environment. So they have to adapt to the group in which they live, which is where he would have predicted that babies, human babies brought up in groups, uh, I mean, involved to be group animals would show a capacity for group interaction very early in life. Um, and even on the internet, we seem to form groups very easily. So psychological topics, how did Darwin approach those? Well, probably the place to start, even though it hardly talks about natural selection at all, but remember we're, we're thinking of Darwin as seeing the world as a theater of agency, a theater of interdependent agents. His book on facial expressions, the expression of the emotions in man and animals, it was called, came out in 1872, um, argues that facial expressions, particularly distinctively human facial expressions like crying, uh, weeping, that is tear production, is a purposeless, purposeless side effect of the anatomy of the face. So he says we scream in um, uh, pain or because we're suffering or because we're frightened when we're kids, when we're babies. And that may have some function like attracting mum and dad to help or whatever it happens to be, or the group actually, he said it was more important that the group members came and helped the baby than a parent. And in the process of squeezing our eyes shut, which may have also protected them against whatever was happening, um, we squeeze the tear duct and water comes out of the tear duct. But that's not a, that's a purposeless side effect of the screaming. But when other people see that tear production, and he said there must be a, an instinct for the recognition or the reading of facial expressions of these purposeless side effects, which gives them meaning. So here we have action and reaction or agency and response. The, 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 baby, the baby screams the, or, or the adult cries and the, the person who sees them crying deduces that they're suffering. Um, so essentially his, it's a social theory of emotional meaning that he comes up with. Um, it's a product of us being social beings and of being agents who look for responses in other people that gives meaning to facial expressions. It's not, not that the emotion inside the individual gives it meaning, it's other people's reading. And, and all his research techniques uh, that he developed to study facial expression depended on how one person reads another's expression. And if, if people didn't agree about a facial expression in what he called these judgment tests, then he wasn't prepared to accept that that expression was a clear signal of anything. So the response of people to, to, the, to facial expressions is what gives them meaning. It's not intrinsic to the person who's expressing. Now that, that um, process of reading others or, or rec what he calls recognition, perhaps slightly misleadingly, um, is, is brought to another level in his study of blushing. The longest chapter in that book on facial expression is on blushing or what he calls self-attention. And blushing is interesting for him because he thinks the instinct for recognition has rebounded in blushing because instead of me reading you, I read you or imagine you, what you are thinking of me 
and respond to that. Um, so the idea is that I I put my I project my uh, imagine my behavior from your point of view and then respond to that and that's what blushing involves and that process of meta recognition or self attention is crucial to his understanding of human agency um, so I'll just uh, get on to that um, I act on what I think you think of me now first of all that isn't just a human thing it's also a, a sexual thing in animals so that's the cover of my book and it's those are two satin bow birds the female is bowing to the male and if you think of the peacock's tail or the beautiful coloration of the satin bow bird the the coloration and the behavior of one bird is designed to satisfy the, or attract the attention or satisfy the desires of the other bird so in fact sexual display implies an action of what i think you will think of me if I do that thing. If, I, if I'm a peacock and I quiver my tail, I assume the peahen is going to like it. Um, and then he develops it into a very sophisticated theory of conscience. So once again, if it, it's, this is all about, this all evolves in the group, according to him, I become, or, or develops in the group, I become concerned about how I think other group members will think of me. And he has five different scenarios for conscience, which are increasingly sophisticated. But essential process is the way in which I deal with my perception of how you are perceiving me. Aesthetics is likewise. So he said that if you look at all the different ways that human beings try and attract each other sexually, you see that some, you know, he, he describes some of the uh, some of the uh, ways in which people dress and uh, or tattoo themselves or decorate themselves or stretch their necks or whatever it happens to be as as ugly to his eye but he knew it wasn't ugly within the the culture of the people who um, developed those forms of attractiveness so he believed that um, in fact as humans developed natural selection became less and less important and sexual selection became less and less important what was important was the culture. And so he said, one of the statements, which I've got up at the top of the slide, human progress depends on in a subordinate degree on natural selection. He didn't think natural selection was terribly important when you got to complicated human beings. Uh, other things, particularly education, was more important. Um, and one of his, the, the thing that he thought, he was an abolitionist, he was anti-slavery, anti and, and so were his parents and grandparents, um, and that this, uh, this Wedgwood uh, brooch is actually made by his grandfather, who was a Wedgwood. Um, it's an anti-slavery, it says, am I not a man and a brother? And there's also one of a woman saying, am I not a woman and a sister? Um, it's, and it's kind of a badge, if you like, of the abolitionists. Now he says that abolitionism and actually prison reform, he thought were the two highest features of human civilization. And he said that was very little to do with evolution, except for our sociability as social creatures, but it had everything to do with education and, and culture. And his great, his great um, political crusade was to protect animals from cruelty. He and his wife launched a crusade and that, that, that's actually a picture from their leaflet on that. So I'm just coming to the end here, back to the future. Um, I would argue that all the things with the except epigenetic inheritance on this overhead projection, he talked about. He talked about individual and group selection. He talked about niche construction, particularly in his book on worms, how worms change the soil in which they live and that makes it easier for them to live there. Phenotypic plasticity and development. So we come to this quote that I started off with from Collat. Because of genetic influences, offspring generally resemble their parents. Um, Yes, genetic influence is obviously a crucial, but so is development. Second, mutation, recombination, microduplication of genes introduce new heritable variations. Well, Darwin's view was that actually it's the phenotype that introduces the variations, as in the flying squirrel, and the genes follow, or the gemules in his language, that the, 
the transmission, the transmitted factors, inherit heritable factors, support the change of habit. That's the Baldwin effect. And finally, in the final quotation, if a change in the environment causes a different gene to increase, what that entirely misses out is the organism. <laughs> it's the organism who responds to the environment and, and the success or failure of the organism, the plastic organism's response to environmental change is what will ultimately, over many generations, lead the gene to increase. So I would suggest that Mr. Kalat needs to um, move on from the modern synthesis and the gene's eye view of evolution. And uh, not just to evolutionary psychology, because I actually feel Darwin, in a sense, is ahead of evolutionary psychology, which is still locked into the modern synthesis. And, um, and actually to think about uh, Darwin's very socialized account of human agency. And that is that. So I'm going to get out of this now. Thank you, Ben. It's Kate Reynolds here. How are you? Um, uh, so thank you very much for that talk. Uh, and we want to spend a little bit of time now, perhaps uh, asking questions and getting some reactions from, from the talk. Uh, so I can't actually see people, but someone can tell me um, who might be keen to ask questions. Uh, but I, I did want to start by um, I guess just commending you on the efforts with revisiting Darwin and revisiting uh, what uh, the psychological aspects of the analysis offer. Uh, and to um, also just ask you about the ways in which, even though um, there's been a neglect of the way in which Darwin kind of considered uh, you know, biology and sort of the human subject, I do get the sense that there's many areas um, of psychology and cognate areas which have moved in this direction, like epigenetic uh, kind of insights, uh, the placidity of human personality, um, effectively that line of inquiry to kind of find the genes uh, that would drive the person have absorbed a lot of energy and time on the part of psychology, but didn't really bring anything to fruition, which has challenged some other models to come to the fore. So in a way, we're probably more Darwinian now uh, than we thought we were. Do you have any comments about, about that? Is that your reading of? Yeah, I, that, that's a good, good question, Kate. Um, I, I mean, I don't think I could have written this book, you know, 15 years ago. I think in a way it's, um, it's a book who's, you know, has its time has come because, in a way, we we did go off after the gene and mechanism and the human genome project, which was going to unlock everything that we needed to know about humans. And then it was sort of that seems not to have happened. And <laughs> I think I can say, um, and yeah, I think I think that's true. I think that um, it, in a way, if we step back from that sort of vice-like grip that the gene seems to have had over the imagination over our imaginations, you know, which is very obvious in some of the more extreme sociobiological approaches to human behavior. Um, then a lot of the things that Darwin, Darwin was a brilliant naturalist and observer. I mean, I, in the methodology chapter in my book, I talk about what natural history and what description and observation, what they entail back in the day. And, you know, it's not just operational definition. It's a whole sort of panoply of skills. I mean, he's, he was a marvelous microscopist. He invented new microscopes. And, and it, I mean, nobody, he won all sorts of medals as a, as a biologist or as a naturalist. They never reference his evolutionary work. It's his capacity as a naturalist. And as a developmental psychologist myself, I know that his work on developmental psychologists, were, I mean, we're still catching up with it. So I think that, that as we, as sort of the, you know, behavioral ecology and ethology and all these different branches, which you're referencing, as they begin to sort of take off or, or be re-recognized for their importance, um, they, I think it's sort of obvious that the approach to evolution needs to be much more open-minded than perhaps we have been. And Darwin is marvelously open-minded. I mean, he, he, um, 
he's very difficult to follow because the disciplines that we now recognize didn't exist in his day. He went across the board, you know. Mm. No, thank you. And uh, other questions that people might have? Michaela, do you have um, a line of sight to that? It, there's nothing there's nothing there right now but i just put a little note in the chat just encouraging people to use the zoom hand or type questions into the q a box if there are any here we go maybe i can get the uh, the ball rolling a little bit um uh, ben one sense that i've sometimes got from uh, not only reading your your book on on, on darwin uh, which i got as an ebook uh, but also some of your earlier work as well. Um, I, I reckon that one of your critiques of standard psychological methods is that we don't study people in the wild enough. Would that be, would that, would that be accurate? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, um, uh, Darwin did do a lot of experiments and he had, um, particularly in botany, he had an experimental hothouse built so he could do his experiments there. Um, but yeah, naturalists, I mean, ethology is the nearest we've really got. And that, that the big move there, I remember when I applied to university and I, I wanted to study with Tinbergen, who was an ethologist, obviously, and he, he worked at Oxford, so I applied to Oxford. And in my interview, I was interviewed by a psychologist, uh, John Hart, who was an experimental psychologist. And I said, look, I want to see, and he said, well, why don't you do psychology? You seem to be interested in animal behavior. I said, yeah, but surely, do you, do you study animals? He said, yeah, we do. And I said, well, in cages? He said, oh yeah, well, they're in cages. And, and I mean, the argument is that we don't really, I mean, that's another reason perhaps evolutionary psychology had to come of some sort. I'm not sure it's sufficiently Darwinian yet, but um, is because we don't really get animal behavior. It's very hard and human behavior, I should say, unless we see it in the wild, as you say, Mike. And the, the problem there is not only we have to see it, but we have to describe it. Um, so, and describing is a whole art in itself. And I think that that's really an area methodologically, you know, an explanation Darwin believed is only as strong as the observations, descriptions of observations to which it applies. So if we don't have rich description, we we'll won't have a strong explanation. Okay, there is a question here from Jane. Jane, did you want to um, say your question? Okay. Hello, Ben. I know I'm in the next room to you, but we've talked about these things many times. And what seems to, what always often comes up for me is that um, the approach, the, the way that you're thinking about things as a, a, you know, natural selection as a law rather than a mechanism, it does leave us sort of a bit bereft. I mean, there, you know, for many people, having a kind of mechanism is like a, a sigh of relief. So we don't have to think about God anymore because there's this mechanism going. If, if what you're saying is that there is no one central mechanism that we have to try and integrate into a whole, is there, is there, is there, some, is there some problem for us as psychologically for being able to tolerate that? Yeah, I, I, I take your word psychologically as meaning, you know, uh, personally, you know, I, I, yeah. yes, I think, um, I think that's right. I think, I mean, Darwin also complained about this, that everybody seemed to think that all he was interested in was natural selection. In the last edition of On the Origin of Species, he said, I've always said there are many different processes and laws which relate to, I mean, his great thing was that we've evolved. He didn't know how necessarily, but he had some good ideas. But the crucial thing was that we had, we had a common descent with animals. That's what he wanted to get across. And I think that, um, I mean, I know friends and even my father was somebody who, who was a geologist, really liked the idea that everything has evolved, everything, including culture. You know, so we've got memes and we've got cultural evolution and all this kind of stuff. And Darwin wasn't like that. 
uh, he didn't he didn't think culture evolved. He thought culture was something that was uh, afforded or or allowed by you know an evolutionary base of social what he calls social instincts and so on and sympathy and various psychological ca capacities. But um, yeah, I think really there is no quick solution to explaining human action, human agency. Uh, I think he was aware of that. He was a very patient and hardworking man. Um, but I think some people, particularly in common sense, would like, yeah, a quick and, uh, I wouldn't call it dirty, but quick and easy answer to why human beings are the way they are. And I think, I think uh, you know, um, tolerating uncertainty and the patience required to work through things and to describe things and not to just publish and perish um, is, uh, is, is difficult. Um, I think it's difficult academically. Uh, I only managed to finish my book by, by retiring <laughs> to find enough time to do the research. And, um, and it took me a long time. And I think it takes a long time to understand human behavior. And that took, it was Darwin took it in my lifetime. So, yep, I think it's tough, <laughs> but fun. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ben. We're, uh, we're out of time. And I just uh, wanted to thank you for coming, for presenting the work, uh, for making uh, you know, it very interesting, I think. Uh, it's uh, led me to want to go out and read and find out more. So thank you very much, Ben. And I'm, it's just such a shame that you couldn't be here. So hopefully we can organise another opportunity for you to come and visit because there's a, a lot more to discuss. So congratulations uh, on your time and endeavour. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to reading and um, listening more about it. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.